of liberty and uh, free speech, and um, they are generous, such generous people, people who really uh, um, care about the world, the society they live in, the city, the community, the neighborhoods, and their own company. It's, uh, it's remarkable, and um, their models, I think, um, for all of us, and I think we all have to listen much closer. They have been warning us for a very long time about these things, they aren't working, they aren't right, and, um, and perhaps no one has listened um, carefully um, enough. We, after a little summer break, opened up again in the fall when we also move a bit more to the political and the theater because we feel this is a time of change, things have to change. We are also in this time uh, in America before the elections, um, where um, we all feel um, the, the weight of history actually on our shoulders, the Black Lives Matter movement uh, that you know galvanized us so much and also showed what is wrong. It's a revealing, you know, and the word apocalypse, which says actually, you know, it's a revealing of something, and um, and it also has uh, some wisdom in it, and it doesn't mean you know. Apocalyptic time, the times come to an end. Actually, no, just things are seen how they are, and often a, a manifestation of Earth on the circumstances, the divine ones <clears throat> and the hellish ones. And we have to um, come to terms with it, as Bruno Latour said, and Frederic Atui Tui. This is what we're going through in the pandemic, is a general rehearsal. What is coming with climate change and everything else is much, much bigger, and we cannot screw this up. And um, artists have now also, I think, the, the uh, responsibility and uh, also the mission <clears throat> to be part uh, of this change, to create an area of uh, exchange of ideas, of presenting, imagining new, new worlds, and making people feel comfortable that these worlds are okay to, you know, live uh, in a new world where we are all really, truly, hopefully, listening to each other. Um, this week, we are still in uh, the Prelude Festival mood, uh, something we've done for over 15 years at the Siegel Center, where we bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater, and it's dedicated to New York theater artists, New York theater ensembles, and we always have great young curators who take the pulse of the time and show and select and curate excerpts from great New York City artists, and they are just representing many, many, many others uh, who, who are doing important work. And, and we ask them to share uh, work in progress, but also to talk about it and to learn from them and to see the way of thinking, the mechanics behind it, the brain, because we do think theater and what's happening on stage is an extension of the brain of directors, actors, but also audiences that this is um, what theater is all about. And if there ever is a time where we need it, it's now. So with us is David Brun, um, who is the, uh, one of the curators next to, uh, Miranda Herman, who is uh, presenting uh, tomorrow, so she can't, or today, so she can't be here with her bright piece, Ben Williams, uh, Greg Sargent, Shisan Choi, and uh, Brian Herdrich, uh, Bryn Herdrich, and um, so um, we will all ask them to introduce themselves. But uh, David, first, uh, uh, give us a little um, overview, you know, about a prelude and this idea of revolutionary side, what it's all about. David uh, is uh, uh, a dramaturg, a critic, and a doctoral candidate at Yale School of Drama. So he's in the middle of it, and he's one of the people who do research in academia. The people who really do research are open and take the time. It's the students, it's the PhD students, and so many others because we all are so busy. What you know, maybe we have lost contact already. It's so hard to, to do that work. So this is great to have him with us. He studies the contemporary theater and performance. And um, so, David, um, tell us a little bit. What's the idea behind what you guys put together with us? Sure. So along with my co-curator, Miranda Heyman, we came up with the theme, Sites of Revolution, that would animate the festival. And, you know, the idea, perhaps obviously so, was that we saw the repertory of revolution playing out daily as we were coming up with the festival, you know, thinking about the uprisings on the street uh, for Black Lives Matter and other movements. Um, but also the slogans, you know, the rhetoric. Um, and we were very excited by that, but we also wanted the festival to be an opportunity to explore other sites, other time signatures at which these revolutionary, revolutionary activities and revolutionary thinking is taking place. So for instance, um, with ERS, we were very excited about the idea that in some way, those Baldwin and Buckley debates are still present with us. I mean, some theorists I enjoy think of 1968 as still happening. You can think of emancipation as an ongoing project and the, the counterforce against that is also an ongoing project. So we were very excited about the way in which 
uh, ERS was thinking about using this digital platform to return to a different time, but that's also our time in certain ways. And with Penny Thoughts, you know, we were extremely excited about any project that wanted to talk about money. Last night, we had a panel called Get Rid of the Gala uh, with a great group of administrators and artists thinking about um, how the nonprofit industrial complex is, you know, wrapped up in uh, what we do in the fabric of our field. Uh, Penny Thoughts was a more personal, uh, even confessional way of approaching that. And these uh, beautiful objects that are coming up on Instagram, these hand-painted um, pennies, I'll let them talk more about it. But I mean, I was just thrilled that um, this project, Penny Thoughts, was taking place through postal mail in some ways, especially when the post office was being attacked. And um, so that was those kinds of multimedia pieces uh, were really thrilling. And of course, Penny Thoughts will have a, a showing of its work of some kind on Friday. I'll let them talk more about but those give you a sense of just kind of the the expanse, um, you know, the kind of uh, mutability of this uh, rubric of revolution that we were trying to capture on the website, preludenyc2020.com. And, you know, today, I think, especially with having people from ERS, a very storied group, someone I actually studied in graduate school, um, and I can still remember, you know, my formative experiences seeing their work along with um, uh, Jisun and Bryn, who are at a different point in their career, but uh, working on equally adventurous explorations. So that this group is just a really excellent, I think, exemplary cohort of what the festival hoped to bring together. So maybe I, I can kick it over to, to John and the ERS folks. They can do their introductions and then um, Jisun and Bren can, can follow suit. Uh, sure, I mean, I'm, I'm John Collins. I'm the artistic director of Elevator Repair Service. Um, I feel like in terms of, you know, this particular project that we're here to talk about, I, I should kick it over as soon as possible to Greg Sargent because this was his baby. Um, and uh, but just I'll just say that it's a it's a it's an example of of the way we work. Um, I try to listen to my ensemble uh, to tell me what uh, what we ought to be doing, where we ought to be going, and even in the case where I pitch an idea myself, I'm usually sort of secretly hoping that it's going to fail in some interesting way because. You know, my brilliant ensemble discovered something more compelling or a truth that I hadn't seen uh, when we started to work on it. So in this case, it was uh, me going to Greg. What, Greg, in, uh, back in it's 2019, September. Yeah. in September of 2019, and saying, mm -hmm. what do you want to do? So can I kick it to him now, now that I've said that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, hello, um, everyone. My name is Greg Sargent. I'm a member of Elevator Repair Service, uh, a longtime member of Elevator Repair Service. And I would just like to thank you for uh, 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 choosing us to be in your festival to uh, preview this new, this new and very important work for us. Um, as John said earlier, uh, an opportunity was given to me by him asking me, um, what I was interested in doing with the company specifically. And for a long time, I wanted, um, James Baldwin has always been one of my heroes, personal heroes, especially being a black and gay artist. And um, I said to John, well, I'll get back to you. And I went onto YouTube and I looked at every interview, um, read as many um, articles as I could about Mr. Baldwin. And um, quite by accident, I came across a debate which I was not familiar with before. And I watched the debate and um, in the conclusion of watching the debate, um, the feeling that I was left with was a complete and utter anger because I was so shocked that the debate 55 years ago touched on issues that were still so relevant today. And this is pre-pandemic. And so I took the, um, I, I tried to find, a try, I found a transcript of the debate and I took it to John and we had a reading of it and we were both very excited at the time. And um, that's how the project came about. Um, I called Ben, um, Ben Williams, my dear, dear friend and a brilliant actor and um, sound designer um, who has played Buckley before. And I immediately asked him with John's permission um, if he would like to be in the project. So that's how we got started with the whole thing. 
more. <laughs> um, and so, and so um, we started and uh, we had a couple of readings and uh, we had an initial live reading where the reception of the piece was, uh, was so um, powerful that we knew we had to do the piece and work on the piece. Of course, the pandemic happened and stopped everything, uh, but we did have um, a few rehearsals to work on it. Um, and uh, we are well on our way now in trying to um, figure out a, a performance platform where it will work that we will do the debate um, in the future. And we're very uh, grateful to you because we learned so much from the filming of um, what we've done um, that we were able to submit to the Prelude Festival. Um, personally speaking, as a, as a, a Black artist, you know, uh, my parents are immigrants to this country. And um, they come from a third world country where um, you really, you're, they come from an environment where you're not really allowed to have a point of view. So coming to the United States in the early 60s via South America and England, um, my, my parents were very clear about the fact that um, I have a sister, uh, that uh, we would have to work very, very hard to make our dreams come true. And um, my parents um, had envisioned certain lives for their children and opportunities for their children where uh, opportunities that they did not have. And so from a very young age, I knew that I was different and I would have to try to carve out a way to have a full, as full a life as possible. And um, to make a long story very short, um, uh, when I was in the second grade, uh, my mother read an article, I'm from Brooklyn originally, that uh, talked about a certain school district uh, on Long Island where 97% of the people that graduated from that school district uh, went on to university. So my mother got it in her head that we were moving to this town. And so we moved to this town, um, uh, an all white town out in Long Island. And um, my father sat my sister and I down and had the talk. And the talk was that there are many people in this town that were very upset that my family moved into this town, that we were not allowed to express any anger. Uh, we had to be the representative of our race. And when I heard this at the age of seven years old, I was furious because I felt like I don't understand why I have to be treated um, as a, a, a person less than somebody else where I have to be conscious all the time of my behavior. And I was very, very angry. And my parents were very, very concerned about that. And um, one of the major reasons why I got into the theater, um, my goddaughter was asking me the other day, why did you get into the theater? And I said, well, it was the only way as a child um, where I could speak for two hours and people had to listen to me. And in a way, um, I'm still doing that. So the fact that I am now the vessel um, uh, passing on the message of James Baldwin about our society, our past and our future and, and handing that over to a new audience is very thrilling and exciting to me. And you know, I'm very grateful to John Collins, the artistic director of Elevated Repair Service, who has always been um, very supportive of um, hiring people of color and, and giving us opportunities, um, and uh, which is why I'm so excited to do this piece. That's all I really have to say about the situation. <laughs> so, thank you, Greg. Well, no, thank you, John. <laughs> so. Vin, would you like to introduce yourself and maybe say a few words about the project and then we'll move it over to, to G-Sun and Bryn. 
Hey, I'm Ben Williams. Um, I'm an actor and sound designer in ERS. And uh, um, as Greg said, I have played William F. Buckley before. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I think one of the things that's fun about what we've discovered just in some Zoom rehearsals during the pandemic, which, you know, we feel that as a theater artist, everything is kind of crippled, um, you know, uh, uh, in terms of what you can actually work on over the internet. Uh, but we made some discoveries. We, we actually made some progress on this piece over Zoom that was really, really great. And, and one of the fun things has been uh, finding a way to uh, not play William F. Buckley, <laughs> and and to kind of um, you know speak his words in a voice that isn't so caricatured and isn't so cartoonish, but is actually um, I don't know. It sounds perhaps more like Jared Kushner sounded like this week when he basically made the exact same argument. Exertions. Yeah. Yeah, so just a bit about the project. You're re-staging, uh, you know, the discussion that took place in Cambridge um, in front of an audience, actually interestingly divided, you know, like a Japanese theater, you know, like audience on the right and the left in a longer hall and front um, of the discussants and uh, Baldwin and Buckley, you know, um, basically had a debate modeled in after a college debate. And, you know, as Greg said, you know, uh, um, why do you have to prove it? And why do others defend the indefensible? Uh, but it was a acting out of, 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 of what uh, was where on people's mind. And it's uh, quite, uh, quite stunning, moving and sad and uh, perhaps also inspiring uh, um, um, presentation they, they gave. So um, I look forward to, to hear that. But um, let's move on to, to you guys. Uh, Ji-san, maybe you tell us a bit. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Ji-san Choi. I'm a playwright and a physical theater artist. I'm currently in rainy Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, and I'm one of the creators of Penny Thoughts. And it is, we call it a digital companion to Bust, which is a live performing, you know, performance that we're currently developing through Soho Rep's um, Writer Director Lab. And with the shutdowns, with the theaters closing, we needed to find an avenue to get the research, which was real life people's stories with of their relationship to money. Um, our project first started, um, we came up with Bust. I think like summer, spring of 2019, way before we could ever imagine um, this happening. And, uh, and I'm sure Bryn will talk about more too. We have a common experience of having grown up in Southeast Asia in the early 2000s when the economy was booming, foreign investments were flowing in and there was such a sense of like immense growth while the gap between the rich and the poor was widening at an astonishing pace. And because of that experience, um, personally, I felt like, and where I come from, which is Korea and Thailand, I felt like money was something that was very evident to me and was present everywhere and I could talk about it. But as soon as I came to the US, it was, oh my gosh, it was the only thing that you couldn't talk about. You could talk about drugs, you could talk about sex, you could talk about class, race, but when it came about personal wealth or wealth that wasn't dealt in an institutional or a structural manner, people clam up. And I've just found that so interesting all throughout. And um, Penny Thoughts is a way to kind of open that clam up a little bit and really starting with the very first memory of money, you know, when was the first time I encounter, I, you know, first encountered this concept that is man-made and kind of going back to the very beginning, the origin stories and all of us and trying to figure out what is this um, relationship, complicated, sometimes beautiful, sometimes devastating relationship we have with wealth and value. Um, yeah, over to you, Bryn. <laughs> Um, that was, Jason, that was great. 
<laughs> uh, you did the hard part. Uh, hi, my name is Bryn. I um, am a director and theater maker uh, primarily. And as Jisun said, um, we are partners in the creation of Bust uh, as well as Penny Thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you articulated it really well. Penny Thoughts, uh, the like the gist for those who have not made it to the Instagram are um, basically that uh, uh, we ask people to contribute uh, their first memory of money uh, via a Google form. <laughs> um, and then what we do is for every memory we receive, we um, take a penny and paint one side of it um, with a design or an image that's inspired by that memory. And then that penny is sent back to um, the person who contributed their memory to us um, via the mail. So it's like, it is a, it's a literal penny for your thoughts. Um, uh, love a pun. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> thanks gang. But, um, uh, so yeah, so I think for us, it was very much, we, in, in our kind of work around part of Bust is we have always wanted to sort of like get this, um, Get, get massive, massive, massive amounts of personal narrative surrounding money. Um, and the pandemic has made it very challenging, but I think we also sort of were, have also realized that, um, you know, as Jason said, there's, it feels like people are very willing to discuss money in a structural way, but uh, people have a really hard time once they start talking about their relationship to it. Um, and so we were trying to help we we're trying to facilitate that. Um, we're trying to facilitate that exchange and make it a little, maybe make it a little less scary or a little more joyful by asking people to um, tell us their very first memory of money. Sort of like trying to get back to what is our relationship with this object before the structures that that surround all of us, that all of us grow into and are shaped by before a lot of that structural um, baggage comes along with it. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, and I think it's also, um, it's also been really interesting because what we've realized over the course of this project is that our first memory of money is often the first, our first experience in some ways with narrative. It's, it's one of the first moments of symbolic thought that we're asked to embrace, like very small children, to them a, a coin or a penny or a dollar is just a piece of paper or just a hunk of metal. And it's, it's oftentimes one of the first moments that we're asked to it, it, you it, treat a symbol in, in a very literal way. It's a symbol that we we learn and then are required to, um, and then becomes more and more important and sort of more and more real to us throughout our lives. And so also like reapproaching what that moment is of like this first story that we encounter with money. Hmm. Yeah, so it's a money race politics first first memories like also Greg shared his memory and um, um, how, how do you all feel creating theater at the moment theater and performance well, how, what is on your guys mind it's pretty hard to think about that right now um, I mean I I was gonna add before like part of the concept for redoing this Baldwin Buckley debate was not so much about showing you exactly what it looked like uh, in 1965, but, but creating the experience of two, 300 people or however many we could get sitting in a room live together, listening to those words by real people speaking them in real time in the present. And of course, those are all the you know fundamental powers of theater. And, uh, and I was very excited to see what they would do to these words. And now, I mean, I'm also extremely grateful for Prelude for giving us an opportunity to work on this and get people to hear it. Uh, but, you know, not to bring everything down, but it's, it's, it's crushing not to be able to follow through on that impulse to, uh, and I know I'm, I'm talking about this, the pandemic situation right now, but it has really put into stark relief um, what's powerful about live theater and, uh, and what we're missing right now. And, and I feel like what our piece is missing. And I'm, I, I'm just, you know, biding my time here trying to, waiting to get, get these words in front of a live audience. 
somebody say something more hopeful. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, I come from a theater background and uh, not really television and film. So having to have rehearsals on Zoom and trying to make that work and trying to uh, relay a statement and get a response <clears throat> when you're not dealing with an audience has been very sort of interesting and challenging. Um, who knows how long this pandemic is going to last, but um, if this is the means now where we get to create, um, it's been a, uh, it's been an extraordinary, you know, learning opportunity. So that's a positive, John. I also, I, I, you know, it's also hard. I think we're so used to being surrounded, especially theater people, we're used to being around a lot of people, working with a lot of different collaborators at the same time in person. And to have that, you know, in the first few months, you know, it was kind of like everyone's lost at sea. Like, we don't really know, is Zoom it, is Twitch it? Like, we, none of us really know or really are interested because we're live, you know, live performing people. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I am taking away from um, doing this project uh, with uh, at the Prelude Festival online is that, you know, we get a memory, um, and this is the literal process. We get a memory, we read it, and we take a penny and we think, hmm, what's the picture that really represents something that this person has shared? And we paint it and we reread it and paint it. And Brynn and I have so far painted like 40, would you say? <laughs> Sorry, we've got a back. We've got a little bit of a backlog. I think we're to fifty-five. Fifty-five painted. Yeah. So like each, that's like you know about twenty memories, and like you know we show each other like, oh yeah, that looks cool. Like oh, that doesn't look like anything. We should, we should redo that one. Um, and by doing that, what I realized is I have spent so much time with these memories in a way that I probably wouldn't if it was a research and we're moving quickly onto a devising process or in-person rehearsal, like sitting with these memories and reading them multiple times and, you know, and kind of exploring in a textual and visual way, you know, I, whenever I see a penny, I instantly remember what that is and like the feeling that evoked. And I think just having the time to expand on that kind of library of thought and library of raw material that I can actually digest um, as a person has actually been kind of incredible. And I don't think I would have had that time if I were in a you know day-to-day -day grind of a theater artist um, because like who has time to paint like 55 pennies by hand? <laughs> Not before the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, I think it also just like speaking I think for me that that just like talking about what we're saying, right? Of like the idea of like what is liveness, basically, and and like that. I think for for at least for myself, I think for a lot of theater people, a lot there's tremendous importance in the audience being physically there, right? Like that is they're having them having that exchange is is so fundamental to the form yes. like you might we can debate right <laughs> like we can like debate even if story is vital to theater or like narrative is vital to it but like actually the audience that interaction is the thing that's so that like to me bef to me that that is what theater is um that is like the defining characteristic and so it has been an mostly depressing but sometimes fascinating challenge of like how do you create that sense of liveness if you can't be in the same space and like is that possible I I like to I, I like to think that you know when we paint this penny and then send it to someone in the mail that um that exchange is distended but it's not broken like that there is there is something there is still a sense of connection there. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's a, I think that's a brilliant way of putting it because in a way, like, you know, I started off by expressing all this, you know, disappointment and our lack of our live audience. And, and I agree, like that's, that is, I feel deeply that's what's essential. And, and, and like you said, Bren, like taking away, you know, 
you could take away narrative and still have, well, you could argue, maybe some wouldn't, but you could take away narrative and still have theater if there was some live exchange. Um, of course, a narrative would then happen, but but you can't take away the liveness and still have something you'd call theater because then you might call it something else. Then you've written something or you filmed something. But to hear you talk about it like that uh, is giving me some hope in a way because it's, uh, you know, I'm always interested in the ways that uh, our medium um, fails and breaks and falls apart and then reconstitutes itself. And so what's happening to us right now in a way is a massive failure. You know, it's like the whole system has been has broken or has been sort of legislated out of existence. And uh, it's nice to, to, to have a sort of hopeful thought about it. Like this is a, this is a, this is a really insane challenge. To, okay, so find a way to make liveness real still. <clears throat> find a way to connect to that thing you do even though you can't do it. So that's, I, I just want to like amplify that thought. I like that. It, it certainly is a new way to reach audiences, to be in dialogue with a theater performance audience through mail. And um, there we had uh, the Paper Moon Company from uh, Indonesia uh, as one of the talks. And what they did, they put uh, little boxes with how to build puppets to all people who came to their theaters. And then the people create a, uh, the puppet and do little things they instruct with them or um, what they also did is they ask people we can give us an idea or pay me fifty dollars twenty like very very low and s give the story to a healthcare worker or a friend of mine so people they commission plays works little stories you know, from the paper moon company and they create something and send it to them and they say we would of course never do that and and you're not your idea was the penny and the mail you know so Reminds me of it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sitting here thinking that this is, uh, first of all, I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, I'm inspired by the description of, of your work, Jisun and Bryn. And I think uh, it's, it's interesting in a way that uh, we're on this panel together today. I, I feel like these two pieces may have some reciprocal relationship because one of the things that James Baldwin um, articulates so powerfully is the is how the concept of wealth um, wealth obtained by uh, the southern agricultural economy in the early United States uh, how that wealth was was basically obtained through the labor uh, of, of black people in the South who received nothing for it. And this is one of the favorite parts. And I, Greg, I feel like it's one of the parts of the performance that you're, you inhabit most passionately is talking about that, uh, that wealth that was taken away and, and, and the idea of, of what, of a relationship to, to, to work and and money, and I, I this just was listening to you guys describe your project made me think a little bit about James Baldwin just now. Yeah, and I was also reading something about, you know, the 60s and the civil rights movement, and they're like, civil rights movement also, also was an equal part, an economic justice movement, you know, they wanted to bring the economic justice to the people who were disenfranchised, who weren't given anything. And I think like, you know, I'm not, I didn't go to a public school here. So I don't know how it is taught in the school systems, but there is a distinct lack of um, just common narrative about when we, even when we talk about the civil rights movement that that part somehow gets left behind. You know, you can empower the people, but you have to give them tools to do it. I just read um, Trevor Noah's uh, memoir and he says, you know, you can teach a man to fish, but you have to give him the fishing rod too. You can't just give them the knowledge and not give them the tools to, you know, to actually execute it. So yeah, that's definitely on our mind as we are developing Bust and Penny Thoughts and, you know, what do we gain by talking about it so openly? And what do we, you know, and, and when, what can we get, get from that? Mm -hmm. 
And I think in the slavery project, the 1619 project uh, clearly pointed out that um, the, one of the motivations for the American Revolution against the British was that the British Empire finally said we have to end slavery. And many in American states said, no, that's not in the cards, you know, that uh, the heroic cause of the revolution also has an underlying <clears throat> of these economic uh, um, uh, exploitation and, and murder and killings and, uh, you know, and that the wealth of, you know, also at the East Coast and, you know, is built on, and there were, you know, on, on slavery and exploitation. And there's still, you know, over the centuries, it's a, the waves still, still reach us. It's so burned into the thinking. And so hopefully this is a time, um, time of change. Um, I have a question for the group that we, we've asked others, um, thinking about a time of change. You know, for me, I, I've been in the field maybe about a decade now, um, have seen some changes. But what I think has happened in the pandemic in part is there's been this, um, well, two things. One, we've seen the interconnectedness of all these issues. I mean, to, to go back to making theater in the time, I think, um, I won't speak for Miranda, but for us, we've been extremely excited by the artistry that the theater community has um, you know, presented, manifested, um, worked on during this time. And we got over 100 proposals for Prelude. And there was just an, an immensity of ideas. We could do five Prelude festivals, um, all of them equally as variegated in terms of form and content as, as the next. Um, there's still great acting to be had uh, as the ERS show proved, I think. Um, but the thing that I think frightens us the most is the actual theater industry and healthcare has been a constant anxiety, source of anxiety for so many people I've talked about in my peer group. And I think that's true now, whether you're at my stage or you've just moved to New York or perhaps people who are older than me and felt more established, but are subject to the same precarity. Um, so this is a long way of saying, maybe a two-part question. One is, what have you seen since March that has been inspiring to you, motivating? It could be under the rubric of theater or it could be in some other field. And, and maybe what also, and or, you know, what is causing you the greatest anxiety? Um, what is your greatest fear? It could be something very material, um, the healthcare for people who are members of Actors' Equity. It could be something much more lofty, you know, the, the future of experimentation and innovation in the field. I'd like to start if I may, um, I have personally found it very um, encouraging and rewarding with the amount of people of all races who have embraced Black Lives Matter. Um, just witnessing um, the rallies and the marches um, throughout the last few months um, has really made me feel hopeful in a way I haven't felt hopeful in a long period of time. Um, so I, I have found that to be very encouraging. At the same time, as a black man living in a pandemic in New York City, where I now um, have to wear a mask, and being even more conscious than I was before about going out at night. I am filled with anxiety about that. So in one way, um, there's been a positive, but because of a, uh, uh, something that is affecting all of us, I'm going through a negative, which reminds me of the worst kinds of racism that I have experienced my entire life. So there you have it, a, a positive and a negative. <laughs> yeah, you know, going off of um, um, what uh, Ji Sun said that, um, uh, John, that these are live audiences and how do we struggle with it? I mean, the German playwright, the great player, Heiner Müller said, um, everybody thinks it's theater is because we have a live audience. And he said, actually theater is theater because the audience member potentially could die. He said, this is what theater is about. It might be the last show, 
of that person. It might be his, you know, the mortality of us, you know, is, is coming out. And I think in, in these times of, of Corona, you know, this is even, um, even um, uh, more open that it is actually something we don't think about. We say, if we die, of course we will, you know. So, um, so what, what are the real, what are the messages? What, do you, what is underlying um, for, for ERS and for, for um, Penny thought, you know, what, what are those messages you want to give? And most pro perhaps some audience member who look at Prelude will be the last thing they see. You know, it's not unthinkable in their lives. And for some, it might be the first time they see something on the screen. So what do you feel? Is the, un what, what do you want to convey? Well, I guess if we're still um, asking people on some level to imagine something live, even if we're not able to do it in the, quite as literally as we'd like to. Um, I feel like there is a kind of, um, there's a kind of out loud struggle going on that's sort of taking the form of all of these, you know, virtual theater things and having a panel discussion like this um, on Zoom. Um, it's, it is inspiring in a way that there's so much effort right now uh, so much pushback against this, um, you know, the, and the, the people are doing whatever they can to be heard. Um, and even if it's not, you know, live in person, like we want it to be, um, you know, I don't feel like anybody's really laying down, you know, we're, we're, everybody's, there's, there's so much standing up to this, um, whether it's like trying to do something socially distanced in a backyard somewhere or, or, or finding ways to make live online stuff feel, you know, reach for the feeling of, of something genuinely live. I do think that's inspiring. I mean, I worry too that, you know, that it's, uh, you know, it, it's gonna demand more and more of us the longer this goes on. And uh, that's, 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 still, that's scary, you know, and I do worry for, you know, we have, we've been fortunate enough to, to create a company that can support some people, um, including a small staff of people full time. And, you know, uh, it's been a tremendous reward to have the work make that possible. Um, so I do worry about how, you know, a, a company like ours that I feel like, you know, we have responsibility to people who, who work with us. Um, I worry about our ability to keep, you know, to, to take care of the people who we've asked work of, you know. Yeah, I, it's, I think when it first, when we first went into um, shutdown and it was like May and June, July, and I, I had this uh, moment when I was talking to a friend that the worst thing that could happen is if we, if the pandemic ends and we go back to exactly how we were before. I, you know, I, that is the most terrifying thing to me. I think there is um, a great reckoning happening now. And I hope when we look back that this was the moment that triggered big changes institutionally and systematically and in the government too. And, you know, so much of that I have agency in, in the circles that I move in and the people that I have, you know, um, relationships with. And there are also the bigger circles and the, the just kind of, it echoes out from there. And, you know, that is like both my biggest hope and biggest fear is that when when the virus is done and when we go back to whatever that we are going back to, if things are exactly the same, that would just, that would, I think that would depress me quite a bit. <laughs> um, yeah.